Say what? Hello and welcome back. It's time for Say What, where we hear from those connected to our industry about what's going on in the world of electrical apprenticeship. And this includes the incredible topics that you are suggesting or are going to suggest. So please keep those coming. I'm your host, Cindy Sandifer, and I'm joined as always by Todd Stafford, Executive Director of the Electrical Training Alliance. Today, I'm so excited about this. Today, we are joined by Aaron Johansson and Nadia Salazar, and they are with Jobs with Justice. I met Aaron at the IBW Women's Conference in September 2022. And she was so happy to agree to be a part of and a guest on Say What. So I'm really excited for you all to meet and hear from her and Nadia. So you were explaining, and so I want to make sure, like, as far as Jobs with Justice, like who you are. And I know. Mm -hmm. You're national, Erin, mm -hmm. Nadia, you're local. Mm -hmm. So who is Jobs with Justice? Like, what is Jobs with Justice? Well, uh, Jobs with Justice is a national uh, network of 36 local coalitions around the country. And so we are focused on bringing together coalitions of community, faith, uh, labor, students to really support workers in their struggles and uh, to organize unions, to collectively bargain, to strike, uh, to win legislation. And, um, and so I'm with the national office, so we support our network. We also have our own sort of national initiatives. Oh. Okay. And then you're with DC, right? Yes. The, okay. And us at DC Jobs with Justice, we do exactly the same thing just at a local level. So we're engaged in the same coalition building with the labor unions, with nonprofits, with student groups, faith based organizations. We want to bring everyone together to support worker struggle, like Aaron said. Which is not unlike our organization as well, national framework, but local yeah. is where the work happens. And exactly. we understand it now, we support yes. you to make that happen. Same thing. So. Yep. Yeah, that helped when, when they were describing it, you know, this idea of like, okay, I can understand that, yeah. that set up the framework for it. So what's the impact of the work you do? I mean, you know, we can hear you define, you know, as you just did, but like, what is the impact? How does it help people? <laughs> is that a fair question? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I think that is a very fair question. In terms of like, you know, I've been organizing since I was 15, 16 years old. This is like my life's work. This is what I love to do. I've been part of a union for as long as I can remember as well. And uh, just my parents were part of unions growing up and in Bolivia. And so just kind of learning that perspective and, and now being in a space where we can see some tangible wins. Like, for example, one of our members, the Domestic Workers Alliance, the uh, DMV chapter of the National, National Domestic Workers Alliance, just passed uh, their first vote unanimously for their Worker Bill of Rights, yeah. which then uh, includes them in human rights, uh, many, many places, which it's a huge win, right? So that's part of the work that we do. Those are some of the tangible wins, and the workers who are impacted by this bill are the domestic workers, and we work hand in hand with, with those uh, organizations. Wow. That's so exciting. So 15, you said, <laughs> so basically you were born into, if you will, unions, <laughs> but you obviously have to make a choice. Like just because our parents do something doesn't mean we're always going to stick with it. And we can even feel the, the opposite the of our family. Helps. You know, the yeah. background helps yeah. a lot. I came in a union family as well. So I understand yeah. the background. It does help when you grow and teach the next generation is part of our responsibility too. Mm -hmm. Same things we do. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But since, so you've been, you've been all in. So now you're working your passion basically. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because there's like, uh, I grew up listening to union organizing stories at the, like at the dinner table, right, mm -hmm. with my family. And in Bolivia, there were times where this was illegal. Um, and just even thinking about, um, like, the times that the military had come into the house looking for union memorabilia and, like, burned it in front of people. And my mom telling me stories of listening to cassettes of, like, revolutionary songs that she had hid uh, while her brother was hidden in an attic because he unionized the media in Bolivia. Uh, which, shameless plug, he wrote a book called The... El Sindicato, the syndicate, which is really cool. It tells the story of that unionization. So I grew up with that, and now uh, being able to support other unions and building their campaigns, uh, developing strategies to get workers to win is just full circle for me. Wow. Wow. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I think, you know, we're just <laughs> privileged. We have certain expectations of how things have always been. So when you start talking about coming into the home, burning things, you know, like we 
to my I have never let me say that I've never experienced anything like that with regard to the union you experience the hate on it you know but Mm -hmm. but nothing to the extent of of that kind of commitment if you will to something your question formed it correctly when you asked what's the impact the impact is different when you know what choices are made as well the impact does make a difference one way or the other wow so from a national standpoint what do you think of I mean how does it feel the impact for you um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been with this organization, uh, well, prior to Jobs of Justice, I was with an organization called American Rights at Work, uh, started 19 years ago this, this month. I, I came on staff, and we merged with Jobs of Justice in 2012 uh, to really bring together the, the research capacity that we had built in, um, at American Rights at Work with the field and the network of Jobs of Justice. So we feel like we um, are in a good position to be able to tell a national story about mm-hmm. Uh, what's happening with workers, um, the struggles that they're facing, and also the real excitement of this moment, which I've been in the labor movement a long time, and I, don't th- I think any- everyone else will say the same thing. Something feels really different. Um, you know, the last year or so, like the Starbucks organizing, the Amazon organizing, um, all of this federal money that we'll talk about, you know, <laughs> going into construction, like there just feels like so much opportunity and real interest in unions. Right. Um, in a way that I, you know, I haven't seen in the 20 years I've been doing this work. Uh, and I saw a report, I can't remember the source, where it comes from, 71% of the population in the U.S. is favorable of unions today. What is yeah, it? The, I think that was the Gallup number. poll. Mm. Great numbers come out of yeah, that. Yeah, highest yeah. it's yeah. ever been, I right. think. Yeah. yeah, it seems like you know, the taboo, yeah. you know, and, and again, that kind of that bad yeah. rep that somebody gave, you know, <laughs> like where it started, how it started, I don't know. Maybe family sitting around instead of doing what your family was doing, which, talking about how terrible union is and word just gets around. But but I agree, like something is different. There's a different feeling, this people-centric idea that I think we're re- recognizing so many things have taught us that, COVID being one, that we have to take care of ourselves and take yeah. care of each other. And I yeah. think that did something for us and probably opened yeah. up the conversation. Yeah. And Jaws with Justice is all about standing in solidarity with each other, being right. there for each other's struggles. Yeah. And I think people feel that way about when they go into Starbucks about wanting to support those workers yeah. that are still trying to get a contract. Or, you know, I think there's a lot of that mutuality now in the way that probably maybe wasn't as strong before COVID. Right. I think you're right about that. And you both kind of addressed, but like, is there anything else we should know about how you got involved with Jobs with Justice? I mean, you mentioned like you were with another organization that merged. Is that yeah. kind of how you all yeah, you came to Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got in the labor movement because I grew up like seeing injustice with my dad having to work three jobs just to support our family and you know it was mm-hmm. exhausting and uh, so I did this that kind of like feeling of unfairness that he should only have to do one job which is teaching you know, he's right. a teacher like right. that should be enough to support a family mm-hmm. and so that's sort of like in my heart and why I've been in the labor movement is um, wanting to have that for other people so that they can earn enough like a good union electrician to support their family and not work all the time and you know, see their young their young ch- children grow up. So, yeah. you got me with the teacher thing. My children <laughs> have just had they've had such fantastic teachers, yeah. mm-hmm. and when I think about that, like, and one of my oldest, her best friend's mom is a teacher. So, kind of getting that firsthand view of how much they work, how hard, how dedicated, the love they have, mm-hmm. you know, for students, and to think about like, and I can't make enough doing this much yeah. work. Yeah. No, I, like, I have yeah. siblings and relatives in close in teaching industry as well, as mm-hmm. far as you know, secondary educational system as well as high school, pre secondary as well. But um, you're right, having to find a way to make something else to do during the summer months to make up for the lost, lost time. Well, really, I know your job continues year round for all parts and purposes, yeah. their job does. It just the uh, salary allocation didn't allow for it. Yeah, there's yeah. something wrong with that if you think about it. That's, right, yeah. Expect them to do the job, yet we don't want to compensate them fairly yeah. for yeah. it. That's right, right. right. And Jobs with Justice, just remind me, so you, how did you find Jobs with Justice? How did it find you? Um, (laughs) So I think a little bit about getting involved in the labor movement and like my experience as a young Latina, as an immigrant, as being previously undocumented, being mixed status family. um, I learned all my organizing skills from the, like Dreamer, we don't like that name, but like the Dreamer Mm -hmm. movement, the youth undocumented, unafraid movement. Um, That's where I got all of my skills. My family was undocumented. So fighting through deportations, fighting through different uh, kind of of figuring out what mutual aid is, reading Immigration Nationality Act at 16 and trying to figure out ways of like protecting our communities. Like you say, we keep each other safe. And like that's that was my grounding. Um, and then understanding the intersection of seeing my dad not getting paid for construction work. 
mm-hmm. because he was undocumented, right? Mm-hmm. Um, my dad being a part-time cleaning employee, working 38 hours, having no type of benefits, and working literally 12 hours, 12, uh, 12 days straight. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I grew up making more than my dad at the age of 17, mm-hmm. you know? And so, like, uh, and then I entered the labor movement, which is beautiful, and, and has ca- created this, like, idea of for bread and roses, which I love the idea of for bread and roses that I think is making a comeback with the youth now. It's, like, not enough to survive, but enough to thrive and live yeah. a great life, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but I've had struggles in the movement, mm-hmm. right? I've been shut down by male counterparts, by people who've been in power for 30 years, Right. And so um, and then like finding other women in the space, finding other people of color, finding other immigrants and saying we can make this union movement better by including us in this space. Right. So despite having heartbreak after heartbreak and seeing many young black queer undocumented folk leave the movement Mm -hmm. because they're disheartened, they've been abused, they've been uh, taken advantage of in many ways. And you all know this many Mm -hmm. unions. Mm -hmm. Their organizers don't have unions. <laughs> um, I unionized a nonprofit at my first job that I had, and we got let go without pay. You know, but we had done such a wonderful job with our youth that they took over the space and got our jobs back in an evening. Right. Mm. So it's the power of community that we're grounded on, and it's a message to the current movement and saying that we are turning the tide, and you have to turn with us. There is no option because we're turning. You're either coming or you're staying behind. Mm. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the energy that I bring into this space, but also that's the energy that brought me and called me to stay here. Yeah. Energy. That's, I was trying to figure out the word <laughs> that I wanted to use, but it's like, wow, that's so, like everything you just said is so inspiring to me in this idea. Like you didn't quit. Like it's hard to keep going when you're constantly facing it's not failure, but it's just the slam doors, right? Mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the turned heads, the, you just all that stuff. So that's just incredible. And you kind of like moved me into thinking about um, our DEI and B. So for those that don't know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Mm-hmm. That's something that the IBW, Nika, and us um, are really invested in. I love and the wanting... belonging term. I haven't heard that yeah, before. Yeah, me neither. I was saying it. lovely. It's, <laughs> So, and so sometimes important. you'll hear A, you'll hear yeah. accessibility, yeah. which is also important, like having yeah. access. Yeah. Um, and like I've heard it said, I think access creates equity and then equity can create access. And so, but yeah, belonging, this sense of being a part of something, right? I'm not yeah. just included. Yep. Yes. It's we have to have you. We need yeah. you. Yes. You know, that feeling. But how does Jobs with Justice, and you've kind of already said it, but like how does that help with that kind of initiative and effort? Yeah, I, I could start, and then you, you should share what you guys are doing locally. But, um, you know, Jobs with Justice is a long history working very – we were born out of the labor movement, a long history working with um, with unions, including with the building trades. Um, and I, I've, I've done a lot of research specifically around what, what works in terms of getting bringing more women and people of color into projects, you know, via project labor agreements and, and um, partnerships with community. And so we see really, you know, the opportunity of this uh, $4 trillion, you know, coming down from, from, you know, still the ARPA money, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the CHIPS and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. And so, uh, you know, for a number of our coalitions, um, seeing this as a chance for folks that they work with in the community to really get get into the building trades, and so wanting to partner with our with our trades to um, to really make that happen, um, we we are starting a pre apprenticeship program uh, with the trades and with transit up in Buffalo. Um, we are sort of restaffing a group called Equity and Possibilities in Construction, which is our tradeswomen group in Denver um, with our Colorado folks. Uh, I know IBW has been part of that program, um, which we appreciate uh, doing this work in Arizona, especially around um, protections for immigrant workers who are undocumented and giving them um, protections when they come forward with complaints, because they're obviously, you know, there's a lot of exploitation there. So we see that as the diversity work as well, as specifically the work that we do to protect undocumented workers in the construction sector. Um, and uh, because when they're fired and when they're deported, um, it brings everyone's standards down. It's, you know, it's important to that everyone has the level playing field. Um, our, our signature contractors as well um, so that we so we see it you know there's a lot of interest in our network we're going to be doing more see a lot of this work coming out in 2023 Missouri as well um, you know really bringing in our community partners and our folks in the building trades um, to to advance diversity because you know I think 
it's in our interest of our signatory contractors. Exactly. If you have a workforce that reflects the community and, and where people, you bring women in and people of color in and they and you retain them, you're gonna win this work, like period. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, like, we will beat out the non-union sector if we can figure this out. And so like that's, you know, that's really where we are as a national office, but um, yeah, I know Nadia, you should yeah. share what you guys are doing locally. Yeah, we have, so just to start, I think, having a union in our workspace, like the organizers that I supervise, I'm the organizing um, director. Oh my God, my title just flew out <laughs> <escaped> my mind. <laughs> uh, but or, we have a CBA, right? Like mm -hmm. at that was one of the questions I had when I got interviewed, right? That in itself shows you that an organization is thinking ahead in terms mm -hmm. of inclusion, diversity. Um, in terms of our work, uh, one of the things that has had a lot of impact is the excluder worker campaign. So we recognize that there's a cash economy that exists um, and these excluder workers were not protected uh, from mm -hmm. like after COVID, right? We had unemployment, we had access to some funding that was coming from the government these folks did not. And so there was a lot of organizing. There was money that was won to work. I don't have the exact number right now and I don't want to give it. <laughs> there was millions of dollars that were won for communities who were excluded workers. So that in itself means predominantly people of color, mm -hmm. predominantly black folks, predominantly queer folks, people who have been dis disenfranchised from a lot of movements and a lot of like structured spaces, if that makes any sense. Uh, so that is one of one portion of our, of our work. Uh, we also work with the Office of Attorney General in DC um, and uh, we do outreach in terms of wage theft. So talk about minimum wage. We have a huge rollout um, last July when the minimum wage increased. Also talking about paid family leave. So we go out to the streets and talk to everyone. Uh, restaurant workers, construction workers, just about everyone we encounter. We have a big program over the summer where we hire fellows um, and they go out and do the, cam the canvassing. So that's a big piece and obviously the egregious mm -hmm. cases, we bring them to the OEG um, and we work in partnership with, with the trades um, as well in terms of these like really, I mean, and I'm sure y'all have heard it, like there are all types of cases out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're starting a project called Women in Construction. So I would love to invite you all to that um, and just bring in women um, that have been in this construction spaces to have a voice, whether they're in a union or not, creating a safe space uh, where they can talk about the struggles that they face every day, barriers that they face every day, and it's become a really beautiful like healing space for a lot of women. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a retiree who was the only woman um, in her field and her trade for 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so she would go to these conferences and all these things, she was always the only woman. And now, you know, she was just at the brink of tears and there's yeah. seven women in the space and then 14 and we're getting to 30. And so um, that's a big piece of our work. And thinking about this infrastructure money, we wanted to go to these these mm -hmm. communities, right? Um, because when they win, we we all win. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's some of the work that we do um, to kind of tackle that. <laughs> I, I met Erin at the IBW mm -hmm. Women's Conference, yeah. and and that was one of those moments, kind of like you, mm -hmm. you know, just you know, I'm I'm new in in the sense of to this part of the work, but I've grown up in union families, right? Yeah. And in this work, the electrical construction industry, and but yes, to have that, to feel that just the synergy and, and the love for what you do and love for the industry, but also like, hey, we're here and we're a part of this. And I, to your point, you know, there's statistics that say job sites, organizations are more successful, the more diversity yes. and not just yeah. race and gender. We're talking all things, even yeah. thoughts. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, having that all on the table, but there are situations where let's say contractors are bidding for work mm -hmm. and, you know, about the same, things are pretty even the customer will actually say, okay, what are you doing on a social justice front? Yeah, right. What are you doing to open up inclusion and belonging? Yeah. And they'll look at what, what's the layout of your workers. Yeah. And if they find this company's almost predominantly white male, mm -hmm. and this one's got more of all the different, you yeah. know, categories that we've listed, they're going to go with them, even yeah. if they're a little pricier or whatever. So yeah. it's, you know, it could cost jobs, right? And yeah. that's, yeah, and you're, we're talking about the electrical industry because most of our listeners yep. are yeah. from this industry. And so mm -hmm. how does the work that you all do affect the electrical mm -hmm. construction industry? Yeah. Well, definitely on the diversity piece, um, you know, we, we want the IBW to be a partner we're, mm -hmm. in all the places that we're trying to build out tradeswomen committees to identify, bring in folks into pre-apprenticeship programs and, and, and all of that recruitment work. We also really welcome women members of the IBW to, to be part of multi-union tradeswomen committees. Um, I think that's a really important 
piece around the retention. Like you have to have a recruitment strategy, yep. but you have to have a retention strategy because it's an yes. investment of money that exactly contractors right. or unions are putting into exactly people right. who go through apprenticeship. Yep. Um, so you want to see them through into you know to, so they're journeying out. Um, but the other piece that that you know I think uh, your listeners in in the electrical industry would be interested in knowing is what you know Nadia was sharing about like the work that we've been doing in D.C. and in, in other cities to go after the bottom feeding mm-hmm. contractors. Um, and so, uh, you know, t- to the extent that we're identifying, you know, where people are really being exploited and helping bring those cases forward to, like, like in D.C., the yeah. Attorney General power, power design. design. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. that was a big one. Um, right. I think there were 500 workers or so that were being cheated out of their wages uh, through power design. And uh, there was a full complaint that, that, we, that was filed that we worked um, with electricians, with workers. And, um, yeah, we... Uh, the suit was brought uh, by the, uh, the Office of Attorney General. And so that was a big, th- that was 2018. So that was something that affected folks in the electrical industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, words through the grapevine, uh, things might not be as great still there. So it's like the fight still goes on, right? Yeah. Like that's something that I think DC Jobs with Justice and Jobs with Justice does really well is having an ear to the ground and kind of yeah. going to, um, where the energy is at, where right. the urgency is at, mm-hmm. right? Like um, we had ATU who had this huge strike um, right up the street from here, we showed up to that. You know, there was the AU folks that were uh, the adjunct uh, profession, uh, professors that were on strike, showed up to that and supported their strategy. So we're very quick on our feet and things like that. And, and I'm saying this to say to the electrical mm-hmm. industry, to IBEW, we are here to support and back you in this work. And I think that's the best way to collaborate and work together. And that's the best thing that we've done um, for this industry. Yeah. And yeah. the correct message you're giving about the collective bargaining agreement, that's the key that holds it all together. And the collective yeah. bargaining agreement is truly the, the tool that yep. binds us all together. So thank you for your help for that. And we'll help you as well, whatever we can do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and um, again, CBAs are, mm. are important, but it's also how we, um, I don't like to use the word police, but like mm. how do we hold people accountable to right. the CBA, It's written right? for a reason. It's exactly. agreed to for a reason. It's all yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely. And you mentioned uh, recruitment and retention. And I think yeah. that's, you know, huge regardless of what we're trying to do yeah. with that, you know, whether it's apprenticeship or, you know, a job site or what have you, is this idea of like, it's not just enough to get you in. And there's that, that B, the belonging, yeah, right? Yeah. Like the, re- the retention is in how do you feel when you're here? Yeah. It's lost yeah. money. And I've said it several times as you described as well, it's the retention issue that matters. We can start as many as we want. What really right. comes out the back end. We yeah. journey out, become, become that journey level worker we're looking for, it matters. Yep. Yeah. Right, yeah. absolutely. So I think kind of an action item, I don't know, I wouldn't want to leave this conversation <laughs> yeah. without offering those that are listening, you know, how do they get involved? How do they get more information? Um, if this is, because I, I can imagine if it's, I know what it's done for me, like sparked something. And yeah. so I think that there's people yeah. that are going to want to know well, more. Go to the JWJ, jobs, jwj.org, our Jobs with Justice website, and you'll see a map of our network about us and our network, mm-hmm. and you'll see where we are. Uh, We have coalitions all around the country. Even if our folks are not as engaged in construction, they have deep relationships with the community that can help put you in touch with with, uh, workers that have not been part of your membership. Um, So, you know, even if they don't have a a program in place, it's worth connecting with your local Jobs with Justice. Obviously, Nadia, if you're in the DMV, (laughs) is a great person to connect with. Um, And you can reach me as well, Erin, at jdbj.org. Um, I'm happy to talk with anyone who wants to think about building out a program where they are. Yeah, and and just piggybacking on that, join the local Jobs with Justice, become a member, mm-hmm. uh, become a member of DC Jobs with Justice. I mean, we uh, the way that our uh, the way that our space works is that our steering committee makes all our decisions, our board makes executive decisions, and you can be part of those um, if you are a member. So join us, become part of our leadership. Um, that's the best way, and also join us in our picket lines. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things that we love to do the most. Uh, and reach out to me; I'm more than happy to talk to you all. I just I uh, think at I'll Be There Awards, we had our I'll Be There Awards on Monday, and I got to give one of my mentees her award. Yeah. Um, and it was a very much a full circle for me because I met her when she was 14, mm-hmm. chanting, and mm-hmm. now she's 25 and has a full organizing career. Um, and so it was just this like beautiful full circle, and uh, I kind of want to continue to do that for people. And so uh, her dad became an organizer and came up to me afterwards and was like, hey, can we like talk and strategize? I work for Impact Silver Spring now and I'm the work, uh, what is it, the food worker justice uh, organizer. And 
that's what I'm here to offer mm -hmm. myself for. Happy to talk to sh their strategy, figure things out, involve you in the programs that we have. So Nadia DCJWJ is uh, the best way to contact me. Very good. Uh, well, thank you for the energy as well. So we, yeah. we appreciate your passion, no doubt. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I was gonna say this powerful. It just, you know, <laughs> that the energy, the power, just, it's so important and I, I kind of, piggybacking off of you, I guess, is thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be here in studio. Nothing wrong with Zoom. Sometimes that's the way we have to do it. But to have you here is a whole different feeling. So um, thank you all so much for the thank work you, you do yeah, and for being here. Thank you for here. having us. Yeah, appreciate thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Todd, closing thoughts after hearing from Aaron and Nadia? No, what passion, right? I mean, it takes someone passion uh, with a lot of passion, you know, to work within our industry and push and always strive for the betterment of others. You brought, you brought the question correctly, the impact. What impact are you having? Is, is seeing the impact's results in Nadia and, and um, Aaron as well. And, and that passion, it carries over everything that we do, and it, it creates our industry. In other words, it's, we belong to the collective bargaining agreement family. I brought that up during our uh, discussions for a reason, because that's what generates. Everything else is voluntary. Reach mm. that point and have the, the collective bargaining agreement involved. When voluntary it suddenly takes way, gives way to action. There's no more voluntary compliance, the more it's, you comply. That's what it's for. Uh, and what power it is in that CBA that we can use in other areas of work, not just our electrical industry, which we heard about, but also in all areas of work facets that we don't have protection for workers for. Great, great, great passionate work. We yeah. See. yeah, I mm. I hope that everybody that's like listening or watching could feel what I think you and I mm. both felt being here sitting with them, um, just their own experience, their personal experiences, um, and, you know, Nadia's story, but just hearing from both her and Aaron and how, why they do what they do. You know, it's not just work for them and you passion. It's, it's going to keep coming Betterment for others, up. right? Yeah. Betterment for others. Like they about. actually right. care about people. And that's just, that's refreshing to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Thank you, Aaron and Nadia for being with us and for the incredible and meaningful work that you do. Big thanks to you, the listeners, for being a part of Say What? Remember that we want to hear from you. So if you have topics that you'd like us to chat about or maybe you want to be a guest, just reach out to us via email, say what, that's S-A-Y-W-A-T-T -T, at electricaltrainingalliance.org. Our next episode is going to drop in May. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So we are going to take time to discuss mental health with an expert in the field. Until then, you stay connected with us through our newsletters, blog posts, on social media. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and go ahead and tell a friend or colleague about it. Stay powered up and we will see you next time. Say what?